Hello and welcome back to the Cheltenham Festival 2021 head-to-head -head series with myself and Dan Overall. We've got a very exciting episode for you this week. It's going to be a little bit longer than normal, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to timestamp right here what time we're putting our selections up. So if you lot want to skip ahead, you can. But if you are interested to know on our thoughts on the Dublin Racing Festival, just continue to follow. So we'll kick things off with the Irish Champion Hurdle, the main event on day one. A stunning performance from Honeysuckle. Dan, take it away. Oh, it was brilliant, wasn't it, really? And it's added another great dimension to the champion hurdle. And it's really set the tone for the two mayors going to fight it out uh, at Cheltenham, supposedly. But it was a emphatic performance. I think Rachel Blackmore got it absolutely spot on. Obviously, took the lead from Petit Mouchoir for most of the way. He couldn't really live with her. Uh, about six furlongs out, she took it on. And she knew that those in behind, like the Sharjah, St. Moore, Apocadabra, is all kind of smooth travellers who probably wanted the race to kind of almost fall apart for them. And she took that out of their hands and uh, romped to our, our most emphatic and impressive visually uh, victory so far. A lot to like about her. Well, in my opinion, but I know someone <laughs> who would disagree. I, uh, I've never been sold on this horse, if I'm honest with you. There's just, it's going to be a horse that I'm going to take on every single time that she runs. Um, and she's given a short price favourite, so I'm happy to continue doing that. I will I will agree with you. Rachel Blackmore gave this horse a, a fantastic ride. And this isn't the first time that Rachel Blackmore has, has given Honeysuckle a fantastic ride to win the race. I'll note back to the mayor's hurdle where I genuinely believe Benny Desdu would have beaten her had Rachel Blackmore not snuck her along the rail. It was just one of those ones. I just, I'm looking at it from the perspective of how I think she'd fare at Cheltenham. Now, I don't think they went too much for pace, which meant the Honeysuckle could sit on the front end. She had a clear sight of her hurdles and hurdling has always been a point that some people have made that's maybe not her strong point. She's a strong stayer. Now, I'm looking back through the field and I'm thinking no one's going to be coming from, well, everyone's going to be trying to come from off, their, off the pace. And five furlongs from home, Honeysuckle basically kicks for home right there. We'd, and I don't think she'll have that luxury in a champion hurdle where they're going to be going so fast. I also, just looking at the runners in behind, Abacadabras was beaten 10 lengths. Now, he actually hasn't had the best of seasons. He was a bit of a hype horse going into it. I also think Elliot's Yard has been uh, quite put in poor form. He's going to be happy to see the back end of this weekend with only the one winner. Now, Sharjah's form, it sort of it changes like the wind. You know, it, one day he turns up and he's very good and the next he's completely awful. Saudi Air, we don't really know where we stand with him. And Sanwa won a handicap last year. I just don't think that this form is going to stack up come Cheltenham. And uh, although Sharjah could most probably perform a little bit better and Abacadabras could most probably perform a bit better, I just don't think uh, Honeysuckle will be able to kick on the way she did. And I also think if you go back and look at the final hurdle, the way that she jumped that, she makes a horrible shape over it. I, I really, I just really think you could pick oh those. that's harsh Get, really... judging her on a final hurdle mate like she was she'd had the race one it was a safety it was like steady in popper everything else you can't die that was the best round of jumping so far in terms of slickness over two miles everything bar up to that point was so efficient and the best it's been i think you'd be really really harsh and i think you've got your jp laced spectacles on if you're really going to be crabbing honeysuckles jumping that day there is nothing to really crab on that front. I'll wrap it up by saying that this performance stinks of Apple's Jade a couple of years ago. She absolutely <laughs> belted the boys over in the Irish champion hurdle. And then about halfway around the champion hurdle, she just couldn't even live with the race. She was folding back for it. And I would love to see that. I'd love to see that in the champion hurdle. I'd love nothing more. Um, tell me down below where I've gone wrong here. Hopefully some people agree with me because I don't think the form is looking that strong and I'd much rather be in Epitone's camp come Cheltenham. If I had to ask you the question, Epitone or Honeysuckle? I mean, they're the same price now, aren't they? So I think it's a, it's a fair question. <sighs> it's so tough. I, I think you've got... I probably would just narrowly with Epitone but there's so little in it. Um, it's one of those where I'm going to wait until the day and we'll see how the price is fair, to be honest, because I think there's, it's hard to split the two and whatever one drifts out to a backable price is probably the one I'll be with, to be honest. If you're the sort of guy that dutches horses, you could just back them both um, at five to two and make a profit if that's the way you're inclined to go. Um, because I believe, obviously, both of them, if they both turn up, I don't think anyone else is going to get to them. 
Um, next up, we have the, I believe this is the opener on day one. It's uh, Gellard de Menil. Now, before we went, before this weekend, I had this set down as the race of the weekend. And given how fantastic it was, maybe it's sort of been uh, overshadowed. Gellard de Menil's now, I think, is your favourite for the Ballymore. How did you think, what did you think of his performance and how do you think he will fare in the Ballymore? There's a lot to like about him. It was um, very professional. I think it was a bit concerning for some maybe to see a hood go on for the first time when he was up in trip. To me, I, for all that he was a bit keen maybe on his previous start, he wasn't overly buzzy to the extent where I thought he might need a hood and Willie's not normally the first to reach for headgear. So that was a bit of a concern, but he got a nice position on the inside, travelled lovely and in the end he beat three horses fairly comfortably who all looked more stayers at the trip. Obviously, you've got Statler, a gentleman's game, and then Fakira, who rallied late into fourth. Um, nice performance. He did it nicely. It, it's a great race now at Ballymore between him, Brave Man's game, and Bob Ollinger. It's another one where there's probably not that much between them, realistically. Uh, it sets up an interesting clash, but I think you're probably also looking at that race for those in behind for Albert Bartlett clues, although that race still is a bit of a murky picture at the moment. I'm not, uh, it's not that I'm not sold on Gallard de Menil because I thought the, the performance was really impressive. He obviously was just quicker than the opposition who, as you say, it will all be Albert Bartlett types. I'm looking through the field. Are any of them really going to be able to compete in a Ballymore? Definitely not. On my one concern, and it's been a concern with other uh, races at the Dublin Racing Festival as well, with the lack of winners that go from the Dublin Race Festival to Cheltenham, and maybe given the ground was quite testing and they would have gone hard because uh, Statler would have made that a real test on the front, that he might just have left his performance at Leopardstown. Um, and with Bob Ollinger and Brave Man's Game both coming to the festival fresh, I think that he might. this might not be his time. And next year, I think he'll make a crack in chaser. Yeah, Willie did say, to be fair, after the race, that he had a hard race. Uh, and you can see that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I currently, at the price, I think Bob Ollinger's third favourite. I'd just be siding with him at the moment at the prices. I think it's worth noting, actually, I think I saw a quote earlier today from Mouse Morris on Gentleman's Game that, obviously, they're not sure about going to Cheltenham, but even if they do, they actually might end up going Ballymore with him. I think oh, he was really? concerned about the Albert Bartlett leaving a mark on him. Yeah, yeah, I, I wrote that, actually, in one of my columns, and uh, I got a bit of stick for some people saying well he's obviously going to go here but mouses can be a bit like that with them he doesn't want to tent for him in the deep end sometimes and he's a lovely long-term chasing prospect so i can see where they're coming from i think he's going to be one you're probably talking about next year more as a, an rsa horse free mile novice chaser rather than a, a cheltenham festival winner as a novice hurdler but he's one to keep an eye on because he looks very good and his point form got a boost today as well the second of his point bolted up so he's a nice time going forward We'll keep flying through the races. Uh, next up, Shaq and Paul Soir. Nothing will be getting close to this lad. Uh, Cub champion chase. It, that was a really, really strong performance. I would have this down as the performance of the weekend. What's your thoughts on Shaq and Paul Soir going forward? And uh, what did you make of this performance this weekend? It, it kind of speaks to the weekend that you can say Shaq and Paul Soir performance of the weekend. And I'm like, there's probably about two or three more you can throw in there, given mm. how impressive he was. It was a an amazing weekend of racing for dazzling displays. Uh, if you wanted close finishes, you're probably out of luck in the graded races, but for individual performances, top class. Yeah, Shaq had a lot to like about him. Obviously, it was disappointing to see Min bow out so quickly. Obviously, something to miss with him. Hopefully, he can bounce back for the Ryanair because he just didn't really jump at all, did he? So he's not right. But Shaq did it well. I think that there was one stage where he didn't look to be going entirely perfectly. I think Notebook and Fakir Duderius were cracking on and it didn't look inevitable that Shakan was going to take it up at one stage, but once he found top gear, it was a sight to behold. And I think people were probably clinging on to the idea of him being a weak finisher to crab his champion chase, uh, champion chase claims. But it's going to be hard to uphold that argument now after that performance. He pulled away nicely and he's made to work for it. And they went a proper gallop. So yeah, it ticks a load of boxes and he's the clear class act in that champion chase at the moment on the form and, a very exciting horse. I was going to say, normally, he normally sort of idles out in front once he's already got the race uh, already done. I would hope he turns up to this champion chase. I hope nothing goes wrong because I think we could uh, be in for a real treat if he turns up. I'm uh, very excited about him, albeit he's a short price now. I think he's going to be odds on. I think he's must about 10 to 11. Yeah. So wouldn't be getting involved in him at those prices. But yeah, should be a really fantastic performance to see. Um, and Nurjamin followed that up. If you're a 
clock watcher, you'd be thinking that Energimine was the better of the two because that was floating around on Twitter that Energimine's time was better. I mean, I don't read into them myself. Now, viewers of this podcast uh, would actually, if they do remember a few weeks ago, this was one of your horses. You stuck at a double figure price as a someone to maybe oppose of Shishkin. Well, since then, he's gone from strength to strength. He's won two races in really good style. And people now genuinely think he'll be able to mash Shishkin. Given that you are so firmly in his camp or what more in his camp that day, do you now genuinely believe that he could beat Shishkin? Um, I think Shishkin's still the right favourite. I think his Cheltenham form, probably more than anything, is what entitles him to be out of the head of the market. Obviously, I think very few winners of the arc or haven't raced at Cheltenham before, but there's a lot to like about Enogamin now. Obviously, he keeps progressing. I think he's one of those where you'd probably stick him up to three miles in a, a year's time and he'd have no issues with it. Obviously, he made all again last time. He's not going to be able to do that in the arc all, but Paul Townend has said on a couple of occasions that he doesn't need to lead, so that would be encouraging but you don't necessarily know about that until they go out and do it but he doesn't look fuzzy and unc- like a complicated ride so you can imagine he'd probably be okay with all mankind pushing on yeah i mean i would have had him as the each way bet a couple of weeks ago i think it was five six to one where you could almost probably hang your hat on that and a race is probably going to cut up a fair bit now i'd imagine as well um 11 to 4 now obviously you've kind of lost a bit of that juice but it's another one where you've got some really good clashes to look forward to at Cheltenham. Like, this is just another one where I, I just can't wait to watch it. If I'm right in thinking he's only ever sort of raced on soft and heavy ground, would that be something that possibly if we got some dry, a dry period between now and March, do you reckon that could uh, be out of his favour? Um, yeah, it's an, it's an unknown. I mean, I wouldn't say the, the ground at the Dublin Racing Festival was unduly testing. Like that track drains very quickly. I don't think it was necessarily a slog fest or anything but it's one of those where it's, it's a question mark but we don't have a definitive answer yet so you can't be too critical for him on him for, for that point I'd say he'll go on it fine the only issue it might raise is does he have the enough pace over two miles on good ground to live with the likes of Shishkin although even Shishkin probably wants further optimally so two and a half would be absolutely no issues for him um, so I, I wouldn't be crabbing too much based on ground. And to be honest, with the way things are going, it could easily be a soft opening day again. Yeah. Wow. Good to soft for race one and then heavy after that. <laughs> yeah, heavy race two. <laughs> <laughs> um, Quilixios, we both share differing views on this one, judging by what we said on Twitter. I'll, I'll let you start. Quilixios is obviously one of the, the horses I stuck up last week. Um, so... I most probably am going to have more of a bias view on it than yourself, but go on, Colixios. So what, you 12 to 1, did you put him up at? And he's, what, half the price now? I can't remember if, if it was 10 or 12, so it was one of the it's two. It's something Double, like that. It's yeah, basically yeah. halved in price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so good bet, first of all. Like, you picked the race, he did, did what he needed to do, and uh, he goes over a chance. Um, again, it was just one of those where he looked like he'd pull away quite comfortably from St. Sam at the last, but I think the gap pretty much held all the way to the line now it might be a bit harsh to crab a horse who hasn't run in a few months about not extending but and maybe it's the fact that there were so many performances that did dazzle that I was just kind of left a bit underwhelmed by him but I guess the more concerning thing for me would be a few comments from owners and and the trainer saying that he's more of a long-term prospect he's probably won for a couple of years they'll send him over fences he'll stay further it's almost sounds like he's not a here and now kind of horse and like whatever he does this year is almost like a bonus. He's won his grade one uh, as a juvenile. I'm not necessarily sure he's probably got another one in him. I think he, he might just be one of these more long-term prospects who doesn't win a triumph hurdle, but goes on maybe to be the best prospect out of the race. We'll see how it goes, but that's often the way with the triumph hurdle. Generally the best long-term horse doesn't win it. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he was in that camp, to be honest. You, you sit there and, as you say, he didn't extend away. Well, the, you've sort of also picked up on my point. This is his first race in about three months' time, so he's very much entitled to improve the run. Um, looking through other winners of the, on the card, you had Appreciate It, you had Monkfish, you had Kenboy. All three of those, they went from the front and they didn't see another rival. Quilixos did give St. Sam about a five-length lead, went and picked him up a, two or two from home three from home something like that and and although he didn't get part he got past and went five lengths clear he did have to make about six lengths on him to begin with uh i think you said the owners there 
they think that he must probably want further. I still hope that the triumph hurdle will suit him. They'll must probably go quite fast and uh, the stiff finish at Cheltenham should suit. Unfortunately, though, you do get the impression from the interviews of Gordon Elliott and Jack Kennedy that they really do think that Zana here is, a, is above this horse, at least, at least from his pace anyway, and what we've seen so far this season. I'm on double figure odds, so I'm hoping he'll be able to nick a place. Definitely still has a chance of winning. Um, but yeah, I, he'll, he'll be grinding away at the finish, no doubt, come Cheltenham. So yeah, still, as you say, a very exciting horse to, uh, to follow. I just wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be too downbeat on his chances for the race just yet. Uh, appreciate it. He's now a very short price for the, uh, for the Supreme Novice Hurdle. He looks most probably one of the bankers of the festival. And honestly, I feel like every horse we've spoken about in this podcast, we could sit there and go, this is going to be the banker of the festival. But he's, he's a very short price. Did see another rival. Going to make a cracking chaser in time. Could he get found out over two miles or is that division just simply too weak at this point? I mean, it looks it. Unless Metier comes out in the better for Hurdle and bolts up off 147, I think his mark is 147, 149, something like that. Unless he does that, you, you're probably realistically thinking this is a, a Willie Mullins classic supreme banker, really, aren't you? There's been so many through the years. He's not one of those flashy two milers. He's a grinding two miler. We all know that. Obviously, I think many probably even had slips on him for Life of the Ballymore and the Albert Bartlett at the start of the season, thinking he'd go up in trip. But obviously, Fernie Hollow's injury has almost kind of forged this route for him, and it's proved a profitable one now. Is it two, two grade ones over two miles? There's a lot to like about him. He's just efficient. I think it wasn't a spectacular performance as last time. He didn't kind of leave that amazing impression, but he got the job done and uh, yeah, seven to four ish for the Supreme. I mean, it's probably one of the few races we'll probably talk about today where it's a bit like a bit of a, a damp squib really, isn't it? As an opener, mm. unless yeah. something, as, unless Messier does really come out and impress at the weekend. Yeah. Uh, he's the worthy favorite. It's not a race I'm really, to be honest, considering some of the others I'm not too excited about, to be honest. Agreed. And normally I'm so excited about the Supreme Novice, but there's going to be obviously plenty of uh, extra place markets up with most of the firms. So it could be definitely worth looking at something at double figure odds to run into a place because I'm sure there'll be plenty of each way value around. Uh, Monkfish from one, I would say, underwhelming performance and appreciate it to Monkfish, who was simply incredible. His jumping is very efficient. I, I was quite worried at one point that maybe this trip would catch him out as he's obviously better known for being a free miler. But he looked to me like he could definitely put it up to someone like Envoir Allen. He's going to be a Gold Cup contender in the long term. Goal, what's your thoughts on Monkfish? Yeah, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah, he just kind of took the ball by the horns, jumped brilliantly and uh, it's just emphatic performance. And you got a feel for poor old Paul Nolan and latest exhibition at this stage. Obviously not much in it in the Albert Bartlett. They had a decent tussle before, like looked like maybe it might go to latest exhibition, but Monkfish pulled out more. But with each duel, Monkfish is pulling further and further ahead and I think just confirming his superiority, especially as a long-term prospect. On a plus side, from my perspective, Paul Nolan's vibes kind of now indicate they're probably trying to avoid Monkfish at all costs. Maybe he doesn't go to Cheltenham now for that race for the uh, for the RSA or what was the RSA. That's good for a clat de rears chances of i mean i'm i'm very open about i don't think he's going to beat monkfish mm. uh, i don't think that but I, I still rate him as a great place prospect which only gets enhanced further if latest exhibition goes elsewhere so the one thing i will say is he probably won't get it all his own way like he did last time at the in uh, at cheltenham the clap the rear is going to go forward as well i think maybe they just forced the pace because it was over a trip too short and maybe there wasn't a whole heap of it in the race so isn't exactly like he needs to go forward like that but a lot to like about him, as you say. We can often get carried away, especially as National One fans, about clashes in the future that never happen. We can only hope that we get a Gold Cup where Monkfish, Envoyalan, and maybe a couple others, maybe this, whoever wins this year's, all turn up and we've got a, an exciting clash on our hands. The Irish Gold Cup, um, I think it's fair to say, I'll open with that none of these horses are going to win or even get close in the actual Gold Cup. Um, Ken Boy had his big day in the sun it was a small field, he got an easy lead it was probably the most perfect race for him bar the fact that the ground might have been a bit heavy a uh, bit, bit soft for him and he obviously wants it a bit quicker I imagine Album Photo sat there in his box not worried at all about any of these I'd be more interested to talk about Native River in a minute who I think might actually have a good chance come Cheltenham but uh, Ken Boy is he going to be going to most probably 
skip this and maybe go to Punchers Town, skip, uh, skip the Gold Cup and maybe go to Punchers Town, sorry? Yeah, he looks unlikely to go for a Gold Cup. I mean, Willie even said he might go for the Stayers. <laughs> it's just, imagine having an Irish Gold Cup winner and thinking, yeah, we'll stick him back over hurdles, mm. such is the dominance of Willie Mullins and what an amazing week he had. Uh, yeah, he's not a Gold Cup player. He doesn't really seem to handle Cheltenham. Maybe hurdles might help him over Cheltenham, but I wouldn't be convinced there. As you say, look elsewhere for him. He's better. He's just better away from Cheltenham. But yeah, it, it was disappointing really just seeing Manella Rindo as he was. Like obviously, a lot of people probably had him as their Gold Cup fancy this year, and it looks like that fall might have taken a bit of a, a hit on him really because he, he didn't jump with fluency this time. Obviously, I think it was two out where he made the real notable mistake where he was trying to close, and that really just kind of took wind out of his sails. I mean, he did rally to an extent, but well beaten in the end. Yeah, the Gold Cup's cutting up a bit now, really, without Manila Rindo. Maybe the RSA form of last year is taking a bit of a hit, which isn't great for champs prospects in the Denman. Uh, obviously, he takes on Klander Zobo as well. So, unless there's a, a good performance from champ at the weekend, it's, uh, yeah, album photo looks um, fairly comfortable. Maybe Aplu Tard's the main danger at this stage. Don't forget about Lost in Translation in that Denman chase, mate. Um, <laughs> no, I'm about to forget about Lost in Translation. <laughs> um, Native River, he obviously ran a Sandown. This is sort of skewing off away from Dublin Race Festival. It's the last we'll talk about before we go into uh, into our selections. It was incredible to see this old boy win at the age of 11. This was actually his first ever run at Sandown. They got really heavy ground, which would have suited him. Uh, but it surprised me that this was his first ever run at Sandown, given that it's a real jump in test and that obviously plays right into his strengths. There was points where I thought the Bristol de Mayer was going to catch him, but Nathan River simply broke his heart and just kept repelling him. Uh, if we got a heavy ground, Cheltenham, do, uh, do you reckon he would have a chance in the Gold Cup? And, uh, and do you reckon he'll even go to the Gold Cup or could they go to the Grand National? Uh, I think, is he even in the Grand National? I don't think he is, is he? Oh, is he not? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think he's going straight for the Gold Cup. That's the target. He's 11 years old now, but great to see him back to his best. And it was a, a spectacular performance. Great jumping, as you say. The ground suited him down to a tee. He's got a good record in the Gold Cup, obviously, as a winner. He's placed the other two times he was in it. <laughs> but 11 years old, you probably think he's vulnerable for win purposes. I don't think we've had an 11-year-old winner since 1969, I think. It's been that long. I think nothing over the age of 10, really threatened and there's been some good ones have tried quarter star Denman both came as 11 year olds and couldn't get it done so it would be some effort and maybe the Tizards deserve a success like that after the season they've had it's been a, a horrible one for them I can definitely see him placing in, in the race especially if it's soft ground I think his inclusion as well is good for the race as a whole with Frodon and Native River likely to go forward we're probably not going to get a slowly run affair like we did last year so it will be a proper test I can see him kind of breaking Frodo on, to be honest. I think Nathan is just the superior horse. Um, and I can see him finishing second, third, fourth. Winning it might be a bit of a stretch, even in a, what looks a bit of a weak Gold Cup. I was going to say, you took what I said there. It's the sort of horse that we need in the Gold Cup because I can't be having real steel cruise up on the bridle <laughs> again like last year, looking like he's going to win it and then go and do what he's done this year. Um, so that, that'll wrap up our, our mini review of the Dublin Racing Festival. I, I do hope you enjoyed that. Uh, before we go into our selections, we'd just like to discuss briefly um, our selections so far. Uh, I'll kick off on, on week one. I put up St. Calvados. I took 10 to 1. I went one point win. Now, he hasn't really moved in the market. He's about 10 to 1, 8 to 1 with some firms. He was far too keen in the King George and then obviously fouled this weekend. I'm hoping that that's enough to deter the owners to go for the Gold Cup and take him to the Ryanair because it wouldn't be the ideal prep. Um, three miles could obviously be a little plan for them next year. Uh, I'm hoping that if he does get pushed into this race, then uh, he'll be a lot shorter on the day. Can you remember your week one selection, Dan? Yeah, I think week one was a clap de rear. So it's the one I'm probably happiest with at the moment. 33s, some would have nabbed the 40s after I opened my gob and uh, drifted immediately. So yeah, happy with that one. This race looks like it's going to cut up a fair bit. Uh, at this stage, I'd probably be disappointed if he isn't in the first three. Beating Monkfish is going to be a tough ask, but I'll take place money at 33s. Week two, I stuck up Deffy de Soy at 20 to 1. He's now 33 to 1. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he did show up better in the Clarence House chase than on, than on his uh, first run. He has the option of the Ryanair, and that is a, a, an actual possibility at this point, and it definitely could be an idea that they go down. Um, 
I think that they could still go to the champion chase, and I think he could still nick a place. I'm listening to the uh, to the racing post, and David Jennings was saying that the vibes were that he badly needed that run in the current house chase, so he's making me believe even more that I have a, a possible chance that Deputy Sword could bounce back to form, but maybe I'm just uh, clutching it straight. Let it go. There. Yeah. Just let it go. <laughs> <laughs> um, who did you go for week two? Yeah, speaking of letting horses go, week two was Coco Beach, oh. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, so the uh, Kim, your good thing, uh, did his winning too soon. He's out of that race. Uh, rip that slip up. Yes. Uh, week three, uh, Grand Annual went for Aramax at 20 to 1. He's now 25s. Not a complete no hoper. Uh, sort of maybe want to see a bit more this weekend. He finished down the field, but he must have already got some valuable big field handicap experience there. Uh, could still be a plot out there for the JP Gordon Elliott team. And uh, yeah, not, not too disheartened with that one. Yeah, I wouldn't be too worried. Like Grand Annual winners don't exactly do too much winning before going on to the Grand Annual. Mm. I'd like to see a bit more spark, but yeah, I think it'd be okay enough. He's probably about the same price, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, so I'm concluding my run of the good, bad, and the ugly with the ugly one, and that was Holy Macaponi. <laughs> Obviously, I think it's kind of a testament to the fact that I put him up at 33s. He ran so poorly at Leopardstown, but he's still about the same price. So in that sense, I'm like, well, realistically, if he did anything resembling his form and his win over Gerard Domino early in the season. It was a good bet, but he's just fallen off now. He never looked like winning at Leopardstown. He jumping was, it was, he didn't get one right. It was painful to watch and God knows where they go with him now, to be honest. It's a bit of a, a bit of a worrying one, but yeah, I'd, I'd imagine to be honest, I'll put him away for a bit and just try and figure out what's wrong. Mm-hmm. Week, uh, week four I went for the ultimate handicap. I stuck up Discorama at 25 to 1. The price is the same. Now, rumours are that he might not make it to the festival, but that isn't from a reputable source, and uh, we'll have to wait and see with that one. But, yeah, nothing to say on Discorama. We won't see him between now and Cheltenham if he was to go. Uh, week four for me was Fury Road. Um, I haven't seen him since. Still the same price. A couple of us are emerging as little dark horses like Kenboy in the market, but not too really worried about them. We might see him in the Boyne Hurdle in a couple of weeks' time. Maybe if he's heavy ground, he'll swerve it. But, yeah, it's same as before, really, with him. Very interesting runner. Just to quickly uh, point on this, you reminded me. The Stairs Hurdle, there's a, f- a horse from, is it, is it uh, David Cotton in France? Paul Saga. Yeah, yeah, really. But they, they think the world of, uh, of this horse over in France. And I think she won the French Champion Hurdle or something along those lines. Uh, she's currently around 16 to 1 I want to say for the stairs hurdle mm-hmm. and obviously if she goes and wins this listed race is it, I can't remember what they're running uh, this weekend if, they, if she does go and win that in the manner that they expect her to uh, then possibly a dark horse for the stairs hurdle um, week 5 triumph hurdle Quilixios uh, 10 to 1 is what I took he's now 6s a, a leading contender in the race I'd say very happy the position I'm in with him yep yeah nice one uh my last one was I write in the Ultima. Uh, obviously, it hasn't run since because he only ran a few days before I posted it. Just basically looking at the entries now for, um, I think they're around 23rd of February. I think the handicap entries come out. So I imagine he'll be entered. I'd be very disappointed if he didn't run. And I still think he's got a great chance. Great profile for the race. Brilliant. All right. Selections this week. Uh, you've got one. Most probably a big prize, I imagine. In a, ha- <laughs> in, in, in a handicap. Take it away. Mm. Yeah, we're entering a bit of a weird period for anti-post bets, really. We've had kind of all the main pointers. We're almost waiting for a lot of the bookies to go non-run and no bet, so we can kind of get a bit more adventurous with them. But we'll plug on, and the one I'm going with is one I've mentioned a few times before on the show uh, in the Fred Winter, and that's Riviere de Tell. Now, you can get 22 to 1 with Bet365 about her, but Skybet recently went non-run and no bet, and they're 20 to 1. So if you can get on with them, I'd recommend taking a non-run and no bet instead of sacrificing the two points. I think that's worth it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a Gordon Elliott's race. A record in this race is spectacular, really. So he's had three winners since 2013 in Flax and Flair, Veneer of Charm and Aramax. And in the last 10 years, had three winners and five placed and arguably could have had another winner as Campiador was travelling all over him in 2016 before falling late on. So he's the trainers are really kind of following this race in recent years uh, and last year he had the first the third fourth eighth and ninth from his five runners so that's quite daunting really and especially when you consider his arsenal in the juvenile division this year obviously you've got Zana here it's the same owner as uh, Riviera Duffel Tell, Duffelcoat, Tia Hupo, Glorious Soft 
And to be honest, it's probably three or four that I haven't even remembered. It's that much of a, a scary kind of weaponry he has for this division this year. So Riviera Tell, she only raced three times, only won once, which is generally what you're kind of looking for in this race. Lightly race, still unexposed. Uh, her first start came in France. She was second in a listed race where the front pair pulled 20 lengths clear. So since then, she switched to Gordon Elliott and she bolted up on her debut for him uh, over the festive period. It was a weak race, but she did it nicely and she did it in a time 16 seconds quicker than the handicap on the same card. Uh, times in Ireland, maybe not the most reliable, but she looks a nice mare. And then she was third on the most recent start at Navan back in January when racing against her elders in a rated novice hurdle. So she was favourite for that race and some were quick to crab her performance for not winning. But looking back on it, and I, I've looked at it a lot because I've been weighing up this one for a while, I, I f- still think it's a fairly decent run, to be honest. She was a bit keen in front. She had slightly right at some of her hurdles. And she was kind of joined and headed by an experienced 132 rated rival kind of midway through. She easily kind of beat him off like he went and faded back through the field. But she ended up setting the race up for what's called the Devil's Coachman. She was previously fifth in behind Appreciate in the Future Champions Novice Hurdle. And he's won three of his four starts. So he's no slouch by any means. And the second horse as well was already was second in the rated Novice Hurdle before and bolted up in a maiden. So I think that form is decent. And what was encouraging, really, is that she didn't just fold once headed, despite being keen. And her jumping actually did kind of straighten out towards the end. And when she was under the most pressure in the home turn, she actually jumped the straightest, which I think augurs well for her chances of kind of correcting that jumping and maybe adapting better to a left-handed track in the future. And in the context of the Fred Winter, I do like it when juveniles take on their elders. I think seven of the last 16 winners had done so from a relatively small representation. So that's promising. And despite only being obviously a juvenile against her elders and in January as well, conceding experience and maturity, it was a bold effort. Despite obviously being conceded and getting quite a few uh, pounds from her rivals, I think it was very promising. And Gordon Elliott has used that race as a prep in the past for the Fred Winter. So Tronador was third in it last year. He went on to be ninth in the Fred Winter of 129. Eight to one, but I think Riviera de Tell is better than he was. And probably more interestingly, is Veneer of Charm, who was seventh in that very same rated novice hurdle before going on to win the 2018 Fred Winter off 129. And again, I think Riviera de Tell is a better horse than he was at that stage. And they, actually, Veneer of Charm also won the same Punchestown maiden hurdle there. Uh, Riviera de Tell did. So a lot of similarities in the paths they're going. So interestingly, she was one of those entered at Musselburgh a couple of weeks ago to get a BHA mark. She's a tough one to weigh up, but they came down on 133, which basically puts a bang on in the kind of range you're looking for for a Fred Winter. And I still think there's more potential for, for her, really. I think that she was entered in the Mayor's Novice and the Triumph. And I think there was a suspicion at the start of the season she might be up to graded class. So off 133 in a race where Phillies have won four of the last 14 renewals from only 15 runners. I think she's a, a fascinating runner. Since, so since Sam is the market leader at the moment, I think he's mainly just there on sufferance because he hasn't been good enough to compete that well in the graded juvenile races in Ireland. Willie Mullins' record in that race is pretty poor. He's only had one place from 14 runners, I believe. And I think it's kind of an afterthought for him. It's a case of if his juveniles aren't good enough to run in the Triumph, they just kind of chuck him in into the Fred Winter just because there's no other race for them. I don't think he really targets it like Gordon Elliott does or maybe some other traders do. So a, a 20 to 1 number no bet or 22 to bet 365. I still think she's better than a mark. She hasn't shown her full potential yet. And given the similarities with the route she took to Veneer of Charm, I think there's potential for her. And I'm happy enough with that price. You've mentioned this horse quite a, quite a few times on this podcast, if I remember rightly. How long have you had this one, obviously, for? Oh, a few weeks, a yeah. few weeks. But after after a first run, then I watched the most recent run for Gordon Elliott. It was kind of, I was talking to a few people about it. And I was like, maybe I was just trying to be overly optimistic about it. But I keep looking back at that race. I think the weakness of the market, really, it's not really developed yet. I can't have since Sam at 10s or 7s in places. Like, he's just not the type to kind of win this race. 
And given the arsenal that Gordon Elliott has in that division, I just think sometimes it's best to go with the stables that have the strongest representation. I tried to do the same with Hitman last year, mm. uh, when Gordon Elliott had so many, uh, Paul Nichols, sorry, had so many. And I thought he would be an interesting one. And it does pay to kind of go with the stables who tend to have the best juveniles. I mean, he, he'll know where she is and he'll yeah. know if she's if he's happy with the Mark 133. Brilliant. My selection is uh, a quite puny in comparison to that, really. Uh, after, <laughs> after, after ripping Honeysuckle to bits earlier on in this podcast, uh, I think it's only fair that I stick my money where my mouth is. Uh, I'll be taking the five to two about Epiton. Obviously, we'll go one point win on that. You're going each way. I think five to two is a thing of beauty. I think that's probably the second biggest price he's been all season. Uh, there's only really two horses who can win this between Epiton and Honeysuckle. Uh, the argument is basically what I've said earlier in this video. I don't think Honeysuckle will be able to quicken away from a champion hurdle field the way she did in the Irish champion hurdle. Um, I'm also hoping that her jumping isn't going to hold up. Horses, uh, they're allowed off days, and Epitot obviously did have an off day the last day. Um, but you've got to take on, you've got to take it that she's going to be fit and firing. And if we get the same Epitot that performed last year, this year, I think she'll win the champion hurdle. A lot easier to say that than the mouthful of 10 minutes that you just gave me, mate. Cheers. More like um, eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I mean. I like to convince our viewers, you know, but you just go epitant, good thing, banker, boom, every kind of uh, awful racing phrase you can pile in. Banker, yeah, put your house on it, all that kind of good stuff is yeah. basically what you just spewed out. But look, we know your love affair with this horse. Long time viewers will know you've been going on about it for far too long for it to be normal and healthy at this stage. It's kind of getting a bit worrying. Well, yeah, obviously she has to bounce back, but very few are as good as Nikki when it comes to getting a champion hurdle back and firing. I think, was it, who is it? Oh, it's Binocular. But back in 2010, obviously he was written off. Mm. Like no chance of coming and he came back to win. So, yeah, he's the man for the job. She wasn't exactly entirely disgraced behind Silver Street, either was she? It was below par, but yeah, I can see it. I mean, but five to two shots in early February, it's... Oh, it was short it's on the just day. poor. It's I, just I, poor. We did, a, we did a podcast uh, actually on the champion hurdle last year, me and you. And I remember sitting there saying, don't worry, boys, the JP money's going to be down on the day. It's going to cut in. It's going to keep coming. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it will. And that will, uh, that actually makes half my book JP horses so far for this anti post series. So let's going to continue that one. Three out of six. It's a winning formula at Cheltenham. So let's keep that one rolling. Um, that's going to wrap up the, uh, this week's Charlton Festival head-to-head -head series with me and Dan. We've got one obviously very big price and one a, a lot shorter, but I'm uh, five to two. I'm not going to let that go unbacked. All right. We hope you guys enjoyed the video. Drop down below if Honeysuckle or Epitome is going to win the champion hurdle, which one you'd be backing, and we'll catch you next week.